This is the Blueprint Podcast, bringing you the latest in cyber defense and security operations from top blue team leaders. Blueprint is brought to you by the SANS Institute and is hosted by SANS Senior Instructor, John Hubbard. And now, here's your host, John Hubbard. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to find information on Mac OS and Linux attacks, or if attackers approach these systems in significantly different ways than Windows PCs? In this episode, we talk with Kat Self, Adversary Emulation Specialist and Lead of Mac OS and Linux for MITRE ATT&CK on the state of security for Mac OS and Linux systems. We talk about where defenders should start for these types of attacks and what tools and data sources defenders should be paying attention to for keeping these systems secure. Stick around for all that and more on this episode of Blueprint. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Blueprint Podcast. Uh, today on this episode, we have Kat Self, who I'm really, really excited to talk to. Uh, she is an adversary, adversary emulation engineer, creator of the CTI team for attack evaluations, and, and maybe especially interesting for this episode, Mac OS and Linux lead for MITRE ATT&CK. So welcome to the show, Kat. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. I cannot tell you what an honor it is to be on the podcast, to be invited, and I'm just Super grateful that like MITRE can show up in this way. I love having everyone from MITRE on. It's always a fantastic show and we can get you guys your just fonts of information all the time. So uh, to start off, what I want to do is get a little bit of background because you have a fairly unique background, at least from what I could tell from your bio and such that I found online. It seems like you've been in, in, in uh, some really interesting stuff and I'd love to know a little bit about your history and how you kind of worked your way into information security and ultimately landed at MITRE? So I love my background because if if you ever read my bios, you'll notice that I followed the career of interesting and it shiny objects. Like I am hands down a squirrel in action. And so I started my career actually in military intelligence. And the reason why I even went in the military was because I was just struggling to get a career. Like I was faced with no college no one would want to train me. No one would want to pay me to be able to get that job experience. And so I was like, okay, well, the military will not only pay me, but they'll also give me job experience, give me training. And I have no bills. Like, this is amazing. So I joined the military and I got that experience, did a couple combat tours um, in military intelligence, I got out. And then I realized I had no purpose. I had really loved, like, I liked my job, but I didn't like the fact that I couldn't do it in the U.S., right? Because, you know, that's a whole thing with military intelligence. And uh, But I needed purpose again. Like, I wanted to do something that I knew immediately benefited somebody else. So I think that's kind of one of those, you don't realize that that becomes a job requirement for you until you feel the impact of your job again with others. And then mm-hmm. you're like, okay, that's officially now a job. Like, that, that's something that I have to have now. So I um, was doing this contract and uh, we are in a tiny little town in North Georgia and I was, I was supporting a, a group, teaching them some of my military intelligence ways. And I came across this unit and the army had just stood up the cyber security unit or cyber warfare unit. And at that time I was doing odd end jobs, right? Trying to figure out where I was supposed to go with my life, et cetera. And like most of us are in our twenties and I was doing open source research for environmental terrorists um, against U.S. interests, right? U.S. company, energy company interests. And I I thought I was super slick. I was like, I was on Maltigo. I was doing all this research. I had no idea about computers, but I knew how to research. I knew how to have objective thinking. And um, I showed these guys, I was like, hey, look at all this cool stuff I'm doing and the reports I'm writing. And they just stared at me dumbfounded. They were like, do you have any idea? the stupidity in what you are doing right now. Like your footprint is so blatantly obvious. Like I could find you by just opening up. Like I don't even have to do anything. I can just look and see where you're from. And I was like, what are you, wait a minute. What are you talking about? This is really awkward. Like I was expecting praise. This is not the expected response I was supposed to get here. And um, it was very eye opening. And then I, I realized after talking with them a little bit that this was an entire battlefield that was, it didn't matter that I was a woman. It didn't matter that I necessarily had the perfect education or the perfect background. Like all that really mattered is that I'd show up and do something well and figure it out. Right. Cause like they were figuring it out. Like they obviously like we were, as we like, you know, when you're vulnerable in a conversation and you show up authentically, like people also tend to show up in the same way. 
And we had a really great transparent conversation how they didn't even know what they were doing. They were figuring it out too. And that kind of set the stage for my career in cybersecurity, where I got a degree in computer science. Um, I then took that degree, specialized in cybersecurity. I got a job at Target. I worked my way from being a software developer, um, where I was able to use some of my military intelligence backgrounds, where I did like analytical behaviors to be able to um, kind of create or help an algorithm into fruition on how to assess a, an organization's security posture um, and the way they regard that and their culture. Um, which we got lucky and we were able to patent it as called like the Pi score, which is like the product intelligence score, and uh, which is super fun. Love Target. It was the best place to bake. And uh, I worked my way up to the red team, became an operator, learned how to specialize on Mac OS. And then I worked my way on to taking a leadership role on the threat hunting program for Target, which had already a very mature threat hunting program. was able to work with an amazing industry leader in that space, David Bianco, and who is also just an amazing human. Um, and then Miter snatched me away during some CTI training. And uh, so now I'm able to take on the roles of kind of like overviewing attack. Like where can we like improve Mac OS techniques? Where can we improve Linux techniques? What does that visibility even look like? What's beneficial to the industry? And then I took on the CTI role for attack evaluations. And in that role, I kind of realized one person doing and like coming up with a CTI plan for an evaluation for the entire industry that's supposed to affect something that's worldwide was a little intense. And so I was like, I think I need a team. I can't be the only, like, I need a sounding board, right? Like no one can be this smart. And so I helped build a team and I just actually transferred that over to our new team lead, which I'm very proud of her. She's amazing. Um, Amy Robertson. And uh, so now I, yeah, I could add that to my bucket list and and now I'm here. Now I'm here on this amazing podcast and super grateful that I get to share this knowledge and my traversal of shenanigans with you. That's a very incredible story. Uh, going from intelligence to red teaming, computer science, threat hunting, like all of that stuff. You have a really broad umbrella, it sounds like, of, of experiences. So it sounds like you're the perfect person for this role, for sure. Um, the, uh, the thing that I, I guess we could potentially kick this off with is your day-to-day -day job at MITRE, right? Running like Mac OS and Linux, uh, specifically focusing on that part, at least. Uh, what is it that you're you're looking at day-to-day -day and, and trying to update and keep track of? Uh, obviously, I'm sure the TTPs and the, the attack matrix, but uh, how do you approach such a big task? First, I rushed in. <laughs> And then I immediately <laughs> regretted that decision, <laughs> overcommitted. And then I immediately backed off and I was like, wait a minute, let's take another look at this, right? Because I think that's what we all do. Like we like to rush into something like, I'm going to do it all. And then you're like, whoa, that's a lot more than I thought it was. So um, what my day-to-day -day looks like now versus when I first started, because when I first started, I was like, oh, let's go through every single technique and let's see what we can add. Let's see what we can update. Um, and then I ran into a lot of issues where... I could update something, but what was the real value of updating that when it was like a sentence, you know, or it was like a week's worth of research on trying to find additional procedures for this type of technique that were more updated, um, only to find nothing. And so I pulled in a lot of my red team friends at first and I was like, hey, so what are all the things that I should add to attack? And then when I went to go find adversary usage of these red team things, there was none. And so then that was actually a lot of waste of time because the thing that makes attack powerful is that adversaries have done it. Not only have like they've done it, it's been reported on. And if you think about how long it takes for companies to be able to truly publish all of that documentation, most companies have a requirement that something has to be seen in multiple different environments. That way they don't give away their, their, the people that they are protecting, right? And then also it has requirements of they have, have to seen it enough that it's a pattern. So by the time you've met those requirements, this is no longer a new thing. This is no longer bleeding edge. And then you've got to go through the legalities. Okay, now what's going to happen if we do release this information? Like what's the impact to us, right? Because that's a really big question that it's tough to answer. It's just tough. Like you don't realize the significance of that until you shared something and you overshared and then you realize the counter that, which I have a story on I can give you later. But, um, but the point is, then they produce the reports, right? Goes through legal and all these processes and then there, it gets published. So you're looking at probably the soonest is six to nine months 
before something really gets published that's a new, well-described technique that this adversary has done and linked to them. Um, so that's the power of attack. It's not only been done by an adversary, like it's already gone through all of those qualifications and then it's an attack. So you absolutely want to prioritize it. So with that said, these red team techniques were great, but they were so bleeding edge. Why would an organization prioritize those when most organizations are struggling just to prioritize the current, like for approximately 400 sub techniques that we have now? Right. Yeah. The, uh, what you hit on there, the, the priorities and the kind of separation of knowledge is, is one thing that's always, um, interesting to me. And, and one thing I'm always hitting on in class when I'm trying to talk with people, uh, about getting threat intelligence and, and finding the right, uh, kind of TTPs to focus on. It's like every organization is like their own little Island, right? And no one wants to share and everyone has to independently discover everything. And it's super inefficient, right? Which is why I love having people from MITRE on and having the MITRE attack framework alone, right? Just telling us all like, Hey, these are the things you need to worry about. Um, but it's, it's interesting you bring, you know, the, the time delay, six to nine months and all of that. Uh, hopefully the organizations are calling out some of these problems directly to the vendor so that they start getting fixed uh, within those times. But <laughs> yeah, we, we can we can get into um, some of that in a second. What I, what I wanted to kind of start off in terms of Mac OS was uh, a lot of organizations have, you know, fleets of Macs, right? They're maybe primarily Mac OS or largely going into Mac OS. And I always get the question like, hey, uh, are we less likely to be a target? Are they safer, right? Apple always wants to cultivate this image of like, we do security better. And honestly, I don't hear about as many Mac OS attacks, but I hear about them, right? They're out there. So how would you frame a discussion on how, what you see in kind of how safe a Mac environment is versus a, let's say, traditional Active Directory, Windows-centric environment? Okay, we are talking about apples and oranges first off, all right? Yep. So if you think about it, Windows, when they came on the market, they were like the go-to for someone that can use Active Directory. Like enterprises needed that type of flexibility. They also needed the backwards compatibility. Mac OS is like, I want to change hardware. Sorry, not sorry. Like, yeah, I can't. There's a new like, processor. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm going to change my processor. <laughs> Yay, backwards compatibility. So Mac OS, the, what you pay for, and, and a lot of other researchers will, will say this, is you're like, if you think about just in what you're paying for when you go and you get a laptop, right? Like, it's like three grand for a MacBook Pro. That's a lot of money. Like I'm, I'm in an old house and I've got to replace floors. And that's like the cost of an entire basement floor. So <laughs> we're clear. Like when we're actually looking at something, like that's a lot of dough that could be used for other things. Uh, so when you're making these decisions, you're like, well, what am I getting in trade for this price point, right? Because I could just go out and get a $700 Windows laptop and call it a day. And what you're really getting with Mac OS is you're getting built-in hardware. So you're getting notarization, you're getting, like, if you think about all the things that have come out, like, they're literally baking it into the chips to be able, that you now have to actually bypass hardware um, requirements to be able to have your face recognized, right? Like, the like that's a part of that system is they're remapping the way the information's encrypted and they're using the hardware to do that. So that way you can't just bypass it via software. Now you have to physically have the device with you. And so that's really what you're paying for. So in one sense, absolutely. Yes. In the other sense, it's still a computer. <laughs> so it's still connected to the internet because at the end of the day, the, the internet was not designed with security in mind. The internet was designed by a bunch of guys that were like, hey, can we talk to this other room? Oh my gosh, we can. Like, that's amazing. And they were just really excited and celebrating that, right? So security was an afterthought in most of these inventions, which is normal if you think about it. Like, that's not wrong, but it does need to be addressed, right? Like with everything as we evolve, we do need to learn how to get better, right? When you know better, like there's this great Theodore Roosevelt saying where it's you do what you can with what you have. Right. And then Maya Angelo, and bleh, Maya Angelo came on later and was like, yeah. And when you know better, you do better. And I think that that's kind of the approach for security is like those two things combined because you can't shame yourself for not being on top of things because you only know what you do, you know, at that time, that point of time. And so does the industry. But once you do know better, then you are responsible for doing better. So with that said, 
Mag is not necessarily more secure, um, but they absolutely have additional features that just differentiate them from Windows, right? And from the compatibility. The in terms of targeted attacks, when when you do see a targeted attack that's going at a Mac OS prominent environment or just at least one endpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you characterize how those attacks may be different or interesting and unique in a way compared to what you would see in a normal Windows machine? Is there some way that they approach it because of those features that's different? Yes, most of them usually have to factor in bypassing. So something that I've noticed at least a trend in is as malware has evolved on Mac OS, what they're really like combating is no longer really user interaction. It's actually hardware interaction. It's like, how do I pa- bypass like notarization, gatekeeper bypass, right? Like, how do I get past this? Um, how do I abuse XPC services so I can gain privilege escalation, right? Like, how do I break outside of the sandbox application bundle? So they're more focused on like, how do I counter these baked in security c- controls that Apple's really been trying to lock down. Um, you can even go into system extensions with that. That is something that Apple's actually been really moving in towards where um, it used to be for Mac OS, you would just like write a kernel extension and then I want to do all these things and play in the kernel, right? So a lot of AVs would write a kernel extension that way they can hook into the kernel um, and then that way they could see those transparent interactions. Well, now Apple's like, no, 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 no you're not getting direct access to the brain. Like what you're going to do is you're going to go through our own separate kind of API. And then you're going to talk to that guy. And that guy is going to give you all the information that you want. And then they've started that. They're still working through that. There's a couple of extensions that they haven't finalized yet. Um, And then as they're working through that, then they've come out with ES logger, right? Which is really significant. Um, And that one is where, okay, now we're going to start giving you some visibility into the kernel type logs that are going on which is fantastic, right? So, because before you had to go through the unified logs, which is where it's like, okay, log, show, and then you had to find the right string and then like pray that that was the right type and look at a bunch of garbage that was posted out on your terminal screen, which by the way, not convenient for doing something at scale. So like they've come a long way and they're moving up to that. Um, But I digress. So the question that you're asking is the unique vectors. And I would say absolutely going after the hardware hardening and then trying to bypass that versus the software. Cause one key thing that actually came from a panel during RSA from um, a researcher at Jamf was that Apple is moving in the direction where they're taking all of like the TCC and they're putting everything behind um, different controls where the user is now able to give specific access to things. So the good thing is the user is very aware right? Like we get these pop-ups and we're like, hmm, this is a pop-up. Why are you asking me for this permission? I don't know you, right? So we have that option. Um, The downside is on Mac OS, unlike Windows, where you can have pretty clear, like you're not a local admin for a reason, right? Like we have very good permission management. On Mac OS, most people have local admin because it's just easier. Like I need to download a program that you don't have in your, like your service software provider, right? So I'm just going to go and download my password manager, or I'm just going to go download my, um, like ver- my, my adding software support for keynotes. That way I can have all my pretty graphics or whatever. So you wind up having local admin just so you can do these little tasks to be able to manage your everyday work life. And at that panel discussion at RSA, one of the things that they brought up um, for the Jam panel was that since that's the direction that Apple's moving, the social engineering techniques should be really interesting in the coming future. So we've seen it go from like normal software, adware tends to be the most advanced. Um, and then that gets baked into the true backdoor malwares. Um, and then we've seen like the bypassing of hardware controls. And I think now we're going to see in the future, the bypassing of like, just really just the management of like social and like that social engineering engagement. I think that's going to be pretty much the future of unique vector attacks for Mac OS. Interesting. Yeah. So when I, when I hear a statement like, well, they're fighting with the hardware, they're not even really as much dealing with users, right? Cause they, they have all these other protections kind of in the way that to me sounds like, Oh, I, that maybe I should be buying one of these. Like it's, you know, they're doing a good job making this very difficult 
on the attackers to uh, to get through. And I'm glad you touched on the permissions thing because I was going to ask about that. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, I know some folks that work at Apple and they're like, I don't know, it seems like I can do whatever I need to do on my computer. I'm like, man, I wonder how they're setting that thing up, right? And so uh, it seems like it's a very different game, right? Which is why I was, I was interested to hear kind of your take on that. Um, when it comes to the tools that like a security team who's trying to watch for all of this stuff going on uh, has available, right? EDR and all the stuff that's traditionally used in the, the Windows uh, sphere. Is all of that kind of stuff uh, still equally as useful? Do we need it? Uh, how, how would your approach to monitoring a Mac kind of vary compared to the traditional kind of Windows environment monitoring? We'll be back after a quick break. If you're enjoying this episode, then you're undoubtedly interested in building the strongest security operations team that you can. For those who want to go even deeper, did you know that SANS has not one, but two courses that cover security operations centers as well? For the leaders, managers, and directors out there, my co-author Mark Orlando and I offer 551, Building and Leading Security Operations Centers. This course covers building your team, your physical and virtual workspace, getting the right data into your tools, and then focusing on security priorities through everyday execution of important security tasks and building the best SOC team possible. For the technical practitioners out there, my course SEC 450, Blue Team Fundamentals, Security Operations and Analysis, is designed to cover everything you need to jump in being the best SOC analyst that you can be. We cover important data types, SOC tools, security logs, malware, analysis technique, automation, and much, much more. In addition, if you want to prove you can deliver the best on any security team, both courses have an accompanying certification available from GIAC. That's the GSOM for 551 and the GSOC for 450. Check out both courses and free demos available on the SANS website. You can get registered today for an in-person course at one of our many events, or go to On Demand and take either class anywhere at your own pace. Thanks for listening. So I'm a threat hunter and an adversary engineer. <laughs> so I don't do management. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that just because I want to preference, like my perspective will be very different. Sure. I'll be focused more on like collecting things at scale based on a, hypo a hypothesis mm -hmm. um, to be able to capture behavior. And tools for that are going to be different than true EDR monitoring. So the ES logger that came out, um, that is, I think, Apple's real first attempt to be able to start creating transparency for security in their environment because prior to that everyone had to build out their own clients which basically means i need to build out a program to subscribe essentially and create my own sysmon is really what i need to do i need to create my own sysmon which i wish upon nobody yeah. so, okay. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> if that's your answer for security i mean that's that's not a great answer so they're trying to get better at it. Um, and most of the really big EDR companies that I've seen basically have their own client for Mac OS and that they mm -hmm. keep updated and monitor and maintain, um, which is great if you have those development resources. Most people don't. Most organizations that I know of, like I think there was actually a tweet from David Bianco today, which I'm just a fan of if you can't tell I'm a fangirl. So, um, and somebody said he was like, hmm, is there less reporting because they're not doing anything or there's just no visibility. Mm. And it's like on Mac OS, like I think the visibility is the thing because most people don't even know which logs to go after. Most right. people don't even know necessarily like, did that log last an hour or seven days? Right. Cause there's a big difference in what kind of logs it's going to keep. Like it's network traffic is going to be way lower than it's like event logs for airdrop. Right. So it's just going to be, they're just different time periods. It's very temporal. So as far as tools go for that, um, I just want to explain the problem <laughs> really quick because there's a reason why people haven't necessarily solved it yet. Right. So I don't want it to be a bashing session on like, oh, Matt can't do this. And it's, it's not that it's just, it depends like all things in computer science. Um, so as far as some tools go, tools that I've used before is OS query. Um, they do um, point in time analysis and gathering. Um, but you, again, have to know what you're looking for and what you're going to pull. I think Kanji is coming up, you know, Jamf is coming up. They all have their own like private kind of like Mac OS specific management tools, but also they have their own spinoffs where they're doing um, their protect versions, right? So it's their security versions for an EDR. Currently, I really wish Attack Evaluations had a Mac OS EDR. I'm working on it. <laughs> We're not there yet, but I'm working on it. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your question. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, the, the other thing I was going to say is uh, the ES logger thing. Um, could you give the, the listeners a little brief rundown on kind of what that does as compared to, uh, you know, what we had before? Like, what, what is that introducing? Is that giving us more data sources, better formats? Uh, mm -hmm. Where's that taking us? Okay. So let me give you an analogy. I'm kind of famous for my bad analogies. So you're welcome. Um, it's kind of like going, like you have to go to the store and go grocery shopping, right? And you're limited to what they have. So they might have something on your list. They might not, but like you have to go to the store, you grab all your stuff and then you go and you check out, right? But either way, there's a trip that has to be made. Like it's going to take a lot of time. You're not necessarily going to like know instantaneously if it's in stock or not, right? Whereas if you're doing online shopping and you're having it delivered to you, but you're not having it delivered in bulk, you're having it delivered item by item, right? That's kind of the difference between the two. So a lot of the previous tools, um, you would have to essentially like figure out what you want to go shop for and go see if you can find it, then pull all that data, hope it's useful and it's what you wanted, and then look at it. Um, other ways, unless you're actually on the actual device where you SSH in, then you could actually look at it in kind of real time, but that's an individual case by case basis, right? Like that's not something that's very applicable for an enterprise that's managing like 10,000 computers. So flip to now with the ES logger, it's like, hey, I want milk, Cheerios, SpaghettiOs, and organic fruit bowls. And like they might be in stock, they might not be in stock, but I'm just going to put this up there. So when you're in stock, just deliver it to me directly. And that's kind of the difference. Um, it still requires a collection of that data off the host, but at least you can very specifically like say, this is what I want to know about. When it happens, let me know. Is that helpful? Yeah, for sure. So making things more efficient, more specific on what you want. And if you're threat hunting, you can say like, these are the things I need. Yes. It's not a perfect analogy. I'm pretty sure once this airs, I'm going to get some comments back like, cat, that was horrible. <laughs> like probably from the guys that designed it. And they're like, no, cat. <laughs> perfect. So with that, um, what are the specific data sources? If you're going threat hunting on a Mac, what, what is it that you're looking at? Because like I know in Windows, right, I'm looking at auto runs and registry keys, and maybe I'm going to pull some forensic sources and shim cache, whatever it is, right? Like, but Mac, people may have not done this before. So if you're going to point people at some of the highest value, like I want to see if this Mac is compromised, you have any kind of favorite things to log or search in that regard? So given my background with CTI, <clears throat> I'm a really big fan of um, threat modeling and being very intentional in everything that I do, primarily because something that I noticed when I was at Target was they often would say, like, we sell socks, cat. <laughs> so make sure whatever you're doing is actually valuable. <laughs> and so it wasn't necessarily deterrent, but like for a lot of us, like time is money, right? Like we can't just... I want to go learn today. Like we have to tie something back into a result that then we can show our leadership. Hey, look, this is legit. Like this is a thing that we should be caring about, right? So what I tend to do is I'll scope something down very specifically. So we can use Dazzle Spy, for example, right? Um, Dazzle Spy is a piece of malware that essentially um, was actually first discovered by Google. Um, the Google tag, like the threat analysis group, which is tag, um, kind of, they discovered, um, Ari Hernandez. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, they discovered a exploit, basically a Mac OS exploits. Um, and then they kind of like expand upon it. They were really focused on the exploit since that's what their team does. Um, but they did throw it out there about what they found that was actually the downloader, which was called MACMA payload. Essentially it'll do device fingerprinting, screen capture, upload, download. So essentially a backdoor. Um, just some audio recording, key logging, stuff like that. Um, so if I am an organization that is primarily Mac based and I want to be able to do hunting very specifically on software that is um, targeting adware or their, that's actually an great example. If I want to do, let's say I wanted to actually look at what is the most recent Mac OS malware backdoors? Like what are, where are they persisting? What are they doing? What's the current trend, right? There's not a ton of reporting on Mac OS. Um, part of my like conspiracy theory is, is because there's just not a lot of logging on Mac OS. So no one's like actually reporting it because they're like, hmm, 
is this even on here? Like, I don't know. We should probably search for that. And then they search and they realize that they have to do telemetry first before they can hunt, which is a whole thing. But um, for like Dazzle Spy, like, so if I wanted to be able to find that, uh, one of the most common locations that I would recommend anyone that especially is new to threat hunting to go look at is the lovely launch agents folder. It is probably the most talked about Mac OS folder <laughs> for any type of threat hunting or adversary emulation. Um, the reason why like personally, I think that is, is because we haven't solved the problem of preventing things that should not run from there to run from there. It's essentially the auto runs of Windows and enterprise needs it to run, period. Like we need things to run. Like there's a lot of programs that update themselves using that. It's just, it's an, a baked in part of the um, Mac OS operating system. So what I would do is I would specifically look in there um, I would look at the different key value pairs. Um, the way Mac OS works is they work with plist files, which are just configuration files, but they use key value pairs. And the significance of these key value pairs is it essentially is telling the program, hey, for this, you're going to do this, right? Or like for a command or for like, let's say I'm creating a process, like you're going to run the binary from this area, right? It's going to be a key value pair. Um, very specifically for launch agents, what you're going to be looking at is like program arguments, um, run at load, if that's set to true or not. Um, you're going to be looking at the strings that it's going to have specifically, like where is that binary running from? Some previous threat hunts that we used to do, but it's really hard. So if you guys find a really great um, way to be able to parse this data at scale, there is threathunting.net. Again, I'm like realizing I'm like super fangirling now. Um, David Bianco has threathunting.net, right? Where it's basically like a generic playbook of threat hunting. So if you're looking like I want to do threat hunting, you can kind of take that playbook. You just got to identify like what's your hypothesis? What are you really going after? What does abnormal look like? What does normal look like? And then like here are some resources to figure it out. Like take that playbook and like go and contribute it there because this is a problem that we've all kind of struggled with, which is how do I differentiate benign from malicious, right? And then abnormal from malicious, because if we're, we're transparent, like there's a lot of weird stuff in our environments that's very normal. There's a lot of really weird programs that do some super sketchy things that apparently are okay. So it is what it is. But like looking at those string value or the key value pairs, um, identifying where they're running from, if they're running from temp folders is one use case. Another use case is if it's running from a hidden shared folder. Um, I think for a while back complex, like APT28, which is a known adversary um, for the JRU, they're known to be able to do Mac OS operations. Um, they loved using shared folders and launch agents and were with their very specifically with their complex malware. Um, the Dazzle Spy uses the launch agents very specifically from the root.local and then they'll have like a software update. So it looks legit, but it's not. But again, it's using a hidden folder. So if you're a normal user, you're probably not looking at your root folder and you're definitely not looking at hidden folders. So there's just like little things like that where they're using the same, the same auto run and then they're like hiding it in fancy places, but it's still all linked to that launch agents folder. So that's where I would start for a newer threat hunter. Um, start there and then figure out what normal looks like and then figure out what abnormal looks like and then start to differentiate the difference between that and malicious. So kind of the same mindset when it comes to, you know, windows threat hunting, right? What's auto running. It's just in a different spot. It's a little more obscure information and, and, you know, learning how to interpret it and having the tool set to interpret those uh, special files, I guess, is kind of the challenge. It sounds like when it comes to Mac OS. Yes. Um, attack obviously is going to have a list of places where you can look for these things. I would assume as well for anyone that's yes. like, Oh, that that's great tips. Like where can I find more? Right. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about Mac before we switch over to Linux here, uh, is, is there any like feature, like hardening feature that's there that people don't turn on or set up or anything like that, that you have seen that could be disruptive or do they come in a pretty secure kind of config generally out of the box? That's a great question. Um, I would say with any operating system, I, I can't say uh, what is a good feature, especially with, the, they're doing a lot of updates in Ventura that I'm not fully spun up on right now since it's literally brand new this month. 
I know like Windows has tons of stuff, right, that you can go in and turn on and crank down. But like when I get my Mac, I kind of feel like my, my hard drive's encrypted. Like I already got Gatekeeper turned on. Like I'm like, I'm not sure what else to turn on here in a lot of cases, like the firewall, right? <laughs> it's, you know, I would it's, say it's, it's on. it is all kind of on. I mean, obviously, like, but there is a lot of stuff that people turn off. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, AirDrop is one of them that uh, there's definitely like Apple's done a really good job of being at the forefront of making sure that they've caught things, but AirDrop, ScreenShare, Bonjour, like these are all services that make Apple seamless, but absolutely should be monitored and made sure that they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, um, that they're not necessarily accessible by all. I think with a lot of Mac OS, they're very focused on easy access, right? So we want, like, if you think about it, if you actually do the true deep analysis on AirDrop, they're using um, hashes from your Bluetooth and from your Wi-Fi connection. And then they're combining those two and they're saying like, okay, is this device in, like, is this contact in your contacts? And if they are, then there's additional things that we'll do and we'll kind of allow because they're in your contacts. Like, so I would say for Mac OS, um, paying attention to the services that are on for ease of access. Like that would be probably one of the biggest things to just pay attention to. I wouldn't say necessarily hardening, like leaving on SIP would be great. <laughs> like there are some people that disenable it like, and you're like, why did you do that? Um, but I would say leaving on those, um, ensuring that definitely all the TC, TCC controls are on, which is what puts that power in the user. Probably the next biggest thing is paying attention to what you are allowing. I regularly go through and disallow apps from access I've previously given them. If you will notice, like in the system preferences, it's very specific on this app has access to these directories, right? You don't really just want to gift permissions to an application unless it's really needed. And I would say that's probably the biggest thing about Mac OS is it's very, very like it gives you the benefit of the doubt to be locked down, but you absolutely can be your own worst enemy in this case. If you've been with us through season one and two, you've undoubtedly heard me talk about some of the courses that I've authored for SANS that are near and dear to my heart as a lifelong blue teamer. What you may not know is that every year and multiple times per year, these courses continue to get better. One of my favorite classes to teach is SEC 450 Blue Team Fundamentals, which is a technical class I designed for anyone working as a cybersecurity analyst for teams large or small. We've continued to update the class and bring in new information on the newest threats, data, and protocols that any defender needs to be aware of. In the most recent course refresh that went live just about a month ago, I've continued to hone the content, diving further into cloud defense, automation examples, detection for modern attacks and attackers, including common things like ransomware and much more. And we've also brought increased focus on new and more difficult to monitor network protocols like HTTP2 and HTTP3, DNS over HTTPS, and TLS 1.3 things that every blue team needs to be familiar with or will need to be very soon. Every version of this class comes with continued focus and updates, and this class is huge. I don't know of any other security operations course out there that contains nearly a thousand pages of slides and notes, 15 hands-on labs with a virtual machine to go with them, including another 400 pages of step-by-step -step exercises for those hands-on exercises, video walkthroughs of all of those exercises, MP3s, a course wiki, and a whole day CTF where you can apply the skills you've learned in class throughout the week. My goal with this class is to bring you the absolute most comprehensive security operations and analysis course possible, and I'm continuing to strive with every release to keep updating the course and deliver on that mission. The depth of content in this course is something that SANS is uniquely positioned to deliver, and I hope you'll check it out if you have a free moment. Go to sans.org sec450 to check out the free course demo, which is a free full section of the course, and an in-depth syllabus to see if it's right for you. We have options to take it live in person, live online, or at your own pace with SANS On Demand. And unlike some other training courses, SANS and I are there to help you along the way with personalized help and explanations for any questions you may have. With the recent release of the GIAC GSOC certification, anyone that takes the class can now get the corresponding certificate that shows that you've put in the work and have what it takes to go head to head with modern attackers. I really think we put together something special here and I hope you check it out. Thanks for listening and now on with the show. When it comes to Linux devices, I guess I should say, because 
there's a lot of you know iot stuff out there that's going to be linux and there's a lot of server there's a whole different game right like cloud instances and everything else um from what you're focusing on and what you see happening in the industry in terms of like large impact incidents and things like that how would you characterize the state of attacking linux either devices or systems as compared to mac os or windows so it should be stated that there's a couple of things going on in the industry, right? One is like even Microsoft had a recent blog and I've provided most of these links um, inside of the, the chat here, but Microsoft had a very specific security blog talking about the evolution of a very specific Trojan called um, Update Agent. And one of the comments that they made was it's becoming kind of a common pattern to be a multi-platform malware, right? So that's one trend. Like we're starting to see tools be developed. Like even Cobalt Strike now has, what is it? Uh, like some other random name that I noticed earlier and I don't have, is like Valkyrie Strike. But even Cobalt Strike's having Linux and Mac OS variants of it. So there's becoming this very common trend with malware developers where it's like, hmm, no longer am I just Windows. Like I am an opportunist, right? I want to be able to run on anything that I land on. And so there's that pattern. The other pattern is a pattern that I noticed. So Intizer had a report for SysJoker, which is a backdoor using Google Drive, which is really cool as a, as a researcher. I always find it easy, like really cool. Like I'm not gonna, like, it's horrible on one side. You're like, oh, bad malware. And the other side, you're like, wow, that's really neat, right? You can't help but the technical effect. Um, and so for SysJoker, like if you notice, like they very intentionally said, we found this on a Linux web server. And then the report they did was on Windows, right? So like, turns out that that specific sample, they were like, yeah, we found this on a Linux web server. Then we noticed that there was also a Mac OS and a Linux version of it. So we did a report on Windows. Like that, that in and of itself is like the problem statement when it comes to Linux. It's like, seriously? Yeah. Like people aren't getting into the the details because uh, well, probably the same things that happening with Mac OS, right? It's harder. There's less tool set, less understanding. Um, is that what's kind of behind that, I assume? Nope. Oh, what else is there? So that's the tricky thing, right? So Mac OS is like, if you think about it, we don't really think of Mac OS as like a server. We think of Mac OS as like my iPhone, my, you know, MacBook Pro, right? The thing that I do all my graphics on, right? Because it's pretty and visual and artists use Mac OS, blah, blah, blah. So that's more end user. Whereas servers, right? We definitely think of Linux. I don't think of Linux at all as end user things. I mean, there's been a couple of people that have come up to me and been like, yeah, we totally use Linux as our workstations. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> I'm <laughs> impressed with you because I could never do that. I love my GUI. So Linux, however, is definitely perceived more as a server. And because of that, it's way more volatile. Like it's the information sharing for servers is way more high risk, more, I guess you'd say for like lack of a better term, top secret, right? Like AWS has proprietary Linux stuff, right? I'm sure Google has the same. Um, so their flavors are a little bit different. So they really don't wanna release these techniques on how adversaries are in their environment because that's proprietary information that allows them to be able to be the successful company that they are. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that, wait a minute, if I talk about what they did on this server, I might be held accountable to it in public because that's a big deal. It's a server. This is where I house information. This is the place that you're supposed to trust when your workstation connects to it. And so it's a very different level of, risk when you're talking about reports on Linux. In fact, most of the ones that I've seen that are really transparent are actually on um, ransomware. And I think the primary reason for that is because you have um, like, you have sites and groups like Differ, uh, the DFR, um, and they're actually giving you sandbox incidents on like how these guys are traversing through their honeypots, showing you the commands, showing you how they do these mounting drives and laterally move, like laterally moving through the environment, their timelines. Um, and their mistakes, right? You're able to see those hands on keyboards. So, but that's honestly been the most transparent reporting that I've seen on Linux. Most reporting on Linux is either very scoped to the software could possibly do this, 
or it's scoped to here's like five commands an adversary did, but we're not going to tell you who because we don't want to like lend the fact that we actually know what these adversaries are doing. Yeah, I think you had used the perfect term for it before we started recording the, the cone of silence effect, mm -hmm. right? Is like there's these high stakes for reporting it. Uh, you, you know, you talked about the time delay before, and I'm sure that applies maybe even more so here uh, with these kind of systems. Um, as defenders, right, trying to deal with a cone of silence like this, uh, how do we approach it? <clears throat> so uh, in this technology age, you know what we're really starved of? What's that? Relationships, mm. true trust relationships. Um, I honestly think that's kind of the key with most things. Like most of the security researchers that I know, we're all in these Slack channels and they're really transparent. But the moment someone brings up, like I need to let others know about this, things get locked down super fast. And so like, I actually have like this diagram that I published a long time ago that I thought was useless until I got more into it. Then I'm like, oh, this is actually really applicable. And the idea it's like when, <clears throat> and it's very specific to the whole cone of silence thing where it's more like when you're on the outskirts of the, co the, the cone of silence, essentially, it's like everyone kind of knows it. And the reason why everyone kind of knows it is because everyone's already countered it. So it's no longer a loss to share that information. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. So, cause I do actually kind of want to solidify what this cone of silence means. Um, I did a presentation a while back on art forgery, which I'm also a former artist, <laughs> FYI. Um, and so probably a reason for my, my, uh, shiny object background and this art forger, what he did was, uh, <clears throat> he loved these masters, right? So what he would do is he would, he would actually get drunk and then he would mimic them and he would like go and just like try to see if he could copy their work, right? Because artists, when we start out, we actually mimic great masters. And the idea is that we practice these techniques so we can learn how to do them ourselves. Mm -hmm. Adversary emulation is absolutely the same, right? It's an art in a different way, just regarding computers. And so he would practice these strokes to the, eventually the point where actually his buddy got like took some of his papers that he had like scribbled on. And he was like, this is, this looks like this legit artist. You know, I'm going to go sell this to an art broker down the street and say these are newly discovered sketches from this artist and see what I can get from. So he did. Well, it turns out it was so successful. His friend made a lot of money off of it. And then this, this forger was like, man, I'm broke as an artist. Why don't I just do this? And so hence the starting of the art forgery. Well, the, at that time, I think it was in London, the um, museum curator had gotten a hold of these sketches. And he was like, well, this is obviously a forgery. And cause he had, he had bought into it at first. And he was like, wait a minute, no, this can't be, this is a forgery. And uh, he was so proud of how he figured it out. Cause no one knew that these were forgeries, right? He went up, had a public release and was like, Hey, you know how I know these are forgeries because of the paper he's using modern day book paper, like not okay. Like, so this is obviously a forgery and we're so legit that we discovered this. So that's how awesome our vendor is. We can discover forgeries, right? If you think about like the marketing terms that vendors yeah, use today. Sure. So you know what this forger did? What? He went and he started finding books from the same date and age that the artist <laughs> lived. And then he'd tear out pages and do the same type of drawings and then resubmit them. Amazing. And no one knew. And the reason why was because the announcement of that information allowed the forger to be able to counter. So the detection was useless. And the same thing happens today with adversaries, right? And that's kind of the point behind having a cone of silence. It's, it sucks. It's annoying. It's such a frustrating experience. Um, and it seems to always have the highest bar to be able to get in. However, it's also there for a very good reason. And that's it. It's to make sure that we can continue defending against people that we don't even know about for nine months without these guys actually realizing they're not in our environment, they're in our honey pots and we're just studying them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, the Linux, uh, effect in, in that cone of silence is, is something I've run into myself, right? Like I, I know that that's a very real and, and difficult thing to try to penetrate. So I, again, right. Miter attack as a data source, right. Uh, 
a place people can go to learn some of these things and, and try to catch up on what they might expect to see and kind of share and can uh, contribute that to um, the TTPs and the things that are going into the matrix there. And I'm assuming can use that at least as a, a baseline of where to start. Cause that, that was again, going to be my same question here for Linux, right? What tool sets are we using? What are we threat hunting? What are we looking to do here to start to lock these kind of systems down and verify they're staying safe? So the thing with Linux is that a lot of times an attacker doesn't need to use a lot of different tools because the local binaries on Linux are already there. Um, when you actually look at the really sophisticated actors, what you'll find is they actually do a lot of binary patching of like current legitimate tools like cron. Um, I think Turla is actually very specifically known for that where they've taken cron and they've packed it with something else so that they're actually running their back door when you're running cron. Um, same with Sandworm did that. Like we actually covered that in a, a MITRE attack evaluation last year where they had taken binaries and they packed them with their own thing. Um, so I think that's something that's definitely like for the more advanced part, that's something that's very relevant. Um, as you'll see a lot of packages like so, and I'm kind of covering things in a broad angle just to kind of give you guys ideas of different vectors on Linux that I've seen. A lot of them are be libraries that are installed um, NPM, other ones like that. So as far as resources go, we have definitely taken a lot of time to really go over Linux. Like XDG is one of them that we've updated recently. Um, I love, I love our team. Our team also keeps getting poached by other companies because they're such great people. Um, and the person that worked on that one's very specifically got poached, but, uh, so, uh, the XCG one was one that we actually just got accolades for from some other researchers because they're like, thank you finally for updating this technique because I've been using it for a while and so have the adversaries. Um, so we've been really trying to go into like, okay, what are ways to manipulate um, open windows or look at open windows, right? So that way as an attacker, I know what windows you typically open. So now I know what um, software I need to infect or modify or you know, adjust so that way it'll blend in with your current noise. Um, so there's a lot of different techniques that you can kind of go through on an attack. Again, attack is that priority. So it's one of those things where it's like just at the very start, look at the, techni the technique and then look at the procedures used. Um, if you need to scope it even more to be able to see, like, could you detect this software in your environment? Then definitely pull the software. Um, but for the most part, I think the procedures are really where the money's at for Linux. Okay. So Final question here, because we're getting close to an hour. Um, to wrap this up, where where do you think attacks are going in these spaces? Maybe it's a separate question for Mac OS and Linux. Do you think uh, in terms of like Apple machines, are the security features outpacing the ingenuity of the attackers and therefore we're going in a positive direction? Or do you think things are gonna be ending up getting worse? And, and same question for Linux. I think I can't answer that question until we have better visibility. Fair enough. You know, like, I think that's kind of the key. Like, that's the one thing that's really lacking right now is that visibility. So it's like, is it the chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. So um, an educated, semi-educated guess, if you can call it that. Uh, since this is like my, like what I live and breathe, I would say macOS is definitely heading in the right direction. Um, just because I'm, I'm super deep into macOS all the time. Um, Linux, I love the fact that there's open source, but it's also tricky as a result because there's just a lot of different distributions. So Mac OS is unified, right? Like it's like one thing in like one company, whereas Linux is very dispersed. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different distributions. There's a lot of different contributions um, and then a lot of different tools that aren't necessarily always updated. So we're constantly like, how long is this tool going to be valid for? One of the struggles that we've had very specifically for Linux is we know we can use ESF log or ES logger. We know we can use different um, endpoint security framework events for Apple. What is the equivalent for Linux? And then that's been really tricky, right? Is it audit D? Is it using the, what is it, eBPF? Like what, what is that? Um, and that's been another tricky thing because it's like, well, how long will it be supported for? And so um, it's, so it's hard. That's why it's like the visibility has to be there before I can make a prediction because there is currently no roadmap, right? It's just, we're watching things evolve as, as they are. Right. Yeah. I kind of expected that would be the answer with Apple being, you know, one controlling body and, and Linux being kind of a whole bunch of different directions in in a certain sense. So yeah. Uh, interesting. 
All right. Uh, so for closing up, um, listeners, what should we have them read? What resources can we point them to? And also, where can they find you online and connect if they have any other kind of questions or other things uh, that they might want to do as a follow on to this episode? Yes. No. So for those of you that are new to attack, um, and especially if you're like looking, so I think sometimes like this field is so big and broad, it's really scary and intimidating. Um, if Mac OS or Linux is something that you really want to specialize in, I definitely recommend you going to like, like attack the actual website. Um, and then be able to like start scoping things down, like pick one column. Um, I'd probably even recommend starting with persistence, right? Just cause it's so the evidence is so real. And then there's an entire course series for getting started with attack. Like watch it. I know those things are tend to be very tedious and annoying and you're like, Ugh. but even if you're just like putting it on the background while you're cleaning your house, like there's something about passive knowledge and just getting familiar with different terms. that's really, really helpful. And so um, watch the getting started, start with attack, start with a column, start just reading it and getting familiar with what's happening. Um, so that's what I recommend for a resource, just because there's a reason why um, it's free. It's community driven. Like there is no profiting from it and it's purely meant for the community and it's driven by the community. Right. So that's why we do it. Um, so it's kind of your free wiki of bad guy behaviors. So that's the resource as far as, um, ways to get in contact with me. I'm actually going to go to DEF CON, AKA hacker summer camp, which basically is the collection of all those conferences that week. Um, and so definitely if you're going to be there um, and you want to meet me in person, I'd love to meet and talk if you want to get started um, or if you're wanting to collaborate or there's things in attack that you're like, mm, this is really not as accurate as it could be, Kat. Could you like update this? Like having a conversation right now with someone on gatekeeper bypass and what does that actually qualify as, right? Like it's a file attribute. Does it really qualify as a bypass, right? So we're having these like conversations because when you get really deep in the technical like it need, you need to have those sounding boards of multiple experts at the table. Um, so come see me. Um, I'm also going to be speaking at Diana Initiative. Um, that one's on leadership. Um, so it doesn't really count for this topic. Um, and then I'll also be going to, sorry, someone's at my door. Um, and then I'll also be going to, um, shh. This always happens. Why does this always <laughs> I have a 150-pound dog. Happens to be too. Uh, one second. I'll be right there. Sorry. Uh, I told someone to come out. I was like, you can't be sooner than two. Like, sorry. It's, anyways. Um, I'll also be speaking at the Adversary Emulation Village. I'll be moderating a panel. And there'll be some incredible people there. Like Nuru, which is from Google's red team. Um, you have Andy Grant from Zoom's red team. You also have TJ Knoll from Offensive Security and Jamie Williams who is also an amazing human um, and works with me on attack. So um, we'll be there for that on Saturday at DEF CON. So yes, yeah, so that's pretty much all the, all the random news that's coming up for me. Fantastic. We'll make sure we get all the links that you passed us in the show notes for everyone so they can keep up to date on those. And I think that's it. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for all the work you do with MITRE and for the community. Uh, it's really hard to find experts on this stuff. So I'm, I'm super glad you were able to uh, donate this hour of your time and, and jump on the podcast with me. Thanks. No, oh, thank you. It's my honor. I really, really appreciate you reaching out.